My name is Menten John Matthews III. I'm a painter, sometimes an illustrator, and uh, very rarely a musician. You know, music and photography, and I, there was all these things I was trying, and none of them were really all that fulfilling. There were these birds I used to draw, and my wife really loved them. And uh, I really love trying to one-up myself every Christmas with her. So I thought, you know, I could paint her a painting of those birds she likes so much. It was about a month before Christmas, I went to this art store, and I picked up these paints and a few a canvas or two, and um, some very mediocre brushes, and as I opened the tubes of paint, like, memories flooded me of my childhood. It was really, like, cathartic. I didn't remember how much I missed that smell. And as I began to paint those birds, like, there, there was weeping. Uh, I, I really had an emotional experience doing that. And this was like a month or two before Christmas, and it was such an impact, and I really wanted to go back and paint again. But actually, I went to my wife, and I, I'm going to spoil one of your Christmas gifts, because the first one I could keep secret, but if I just kept going over and doing this, she was going to eventually figure it out, and I didn't want it to be like that. So I sat her down, and I said, you know, I, I painted you something, and, and, I, and I, I can't stop. You know, I really I need to paint. And this, like, void in me, this, 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 this empty hole that I could never fill, was just immediately filled when I was painting. Like everything made sense. Like there was nothing in the world that didn't make sense to me while I was painting. It was this, it was like this perfect moment and something that I'd been looking for, but at the same time remembering it when I did it as a kid. But I, I guess in a lot of ways, like I abandoned and hid those memories and feelings for myself. I, I wouldn't go back there. Then a lot of the pain started, then a lot of the really difficult stuff, because then it's like there were things I wanted to paint that I just, I didn't have the technique to do or I didn't know how to do. And I just sat down and just kept painting. And there was one painting in particular I remember sitting and painting. It was called Negretto Three, and I remember sitting back after painting that painting and going, this is, this is what I am. And, and there wasn't any questioning of that. There wasn't any doubt. I grew up in rural Mississippi, which is a, a very interesting place to grow up. If you're different at all, or you maybe question things, or have differences of opinion, it's not really a place for that. There was, you know, some domestic abuse in my house, and what I painted, how I painted it, was being very controlled from like a religious standpoint. And, you know, various paintings I would do as a child would be brought into question at school. And I had a stack of paintings burned, which was actually one of the most traumatic events of my life. I remember sitting in the backyard watching a stack of, of paintings being burned, and it changed me. It was, it was horrible. I stopped painting so that I could kind of gain back control. From what I understand now, it was a, was a pretty abusive situation. And I was still very creative, and I wanted to do something, so I kind of immediately went to music and uh, began making and recording music pretty young. And I spent most of my life attempting to achieve something with music. And I like music. I especially like my violin and my cello. I, I love them, you know, and they mean a lot to me, and I spend a lot of time with them. There's about a 10 to 15 minute period during any good painting where there's a bunch of mush, especially the way I paint. There's a bunch of mush and mashing stuff, right? And I work with completely organic and natural pigment. So it's literally jewelry mashed together on a canvas. And that 
mash starts to have a presence and there's nothing like it. That feeling, that, that 10 to 15 minute period is the most addictive, amazing thing that I cannot quantify it or articulate it. You have to truly experience it, otherwise there's no way to express it. And like some other artists I know, you know, like Dave Stupakis, I said, we've talked about it and he knows those moments. And it's kind of crazy. It's, it's like being in this strange fraternity because it makes everything in your life worth it. There's not any pain or discomfort. It's not just that it turns into an image. There, there begins to be a presence in there. And part of yourself is being externalized on a canvas or a panel that literally you get to communicate with in a way that does not happen outside of dreams. And that happening externally, I don't know exactly how it functions, but it's there. It's very much there, it's very real. It's, it's very tangible to anyone who's experienced it. And I never feel like I'm, I'm leaving a painting or a painting's leaving me. It's just uh, sometimes you need them closer than others. You know, they're really important aspects, especially if you kind of paint the way that I try to paint, which is painting images that come to me during meditations or hypnagogic states. I'll paint them and not even know what they mean sometimes. And then throughout the course of months and weeks, I'll begin to realize what they're saying to me. You know, one of the problems with being in bands is you have to deal with musicians. And being an artist, <clears throat> you can't, it's something you can't do like in a room by yourself. And however pretentious it sounds, I absolutely love spending time by myself. You know, sometimes people will be like, you need to get out of the office, you know? And it's like, I've been painting. I've been outside of the office all day. Like, it, it's not like I feel like I'm in a studio. You know, I'm in the painting. You know, it really is like that. And it sounds like I'm trying to wax poetic about it, but it really is. Like, if I'm painting a wooded area or a woman, I'm spending time there. Answering the question of what an audience is for is really hard. One of the easiest places to talk, talk about it is musician. You're on stage, you're playing music, and that energy is being released, and the audience is picking it up, and it's this circular, you know, figure eight thing that, that takes place. But that's not really what an audience is for. That's kind of the beginning lesson of it, but it's not really the end point. The end point is like truly communicating and truly having a conversation. On some level, when you're both getting it, when people are responding to the imagery and there doesn't have to be a transference of words or body language to get that, I think it's very important. And I do think we missed a lot of that from the old master painters. You didn't need an education. Even though, even though people will tell you you need an education to look at those paintings, if you walk into the Sistine Chapel, you're gonna get moved. So I think in the end, the true definition of art is does it move you, does it move me? You know, whether it's a photograph or a poem or a, or a song or a painting. And that somewhere in there is the articulation of what an audience is for, but it's not something that I think is simple. It's very simple to understand, I think, but it's not something that you can articulate easily. You know, growing up in Mississippi, it was very obvious that I was not part of their tribe. And one of my issues in life has always been that I don't really feel like I belong anywhere. And <clears throat> the last time I was at Last Rites, it was a group show for Tome 2. And I remember sitting there feeling like uh, this was a place I belonged for like the first time in my entire life. Like, Paul is one of the nicest people and, and amazingly talented. And you're sitting there with like Paul and David Stupakis and you're just having conversations that you all understand and they got me and I feel like on certain levels I, I get them and none of us really like being that social and we're all back in a smoking room like, and, and we're all talking about art. And it, it, it wasn't like competitive and it wasn't, you know, I'm better than you, or look at what I can do and you can't. It's just like a general love of art. And I feel 
so honored to have a show at that gallery. I can't ask for a better situation. I don't think, you know, Erica or Paul, I could ask for better people to do this with. Growing up and when I got into art, the pinnacle for me would be having a show, a solo show. So it's not like when they talked to me about doing it, I was like, oh my God, what am I gonna do? I had kind of a list of different ideas. But I think that whatever show you do should be congruent with what's going on in your life. So I knew pretty early on that Catabasis would be a good place. Because fundamentally doing your own personal catabasis to make art with is going to fundamentally change you. And there's going to have to be a narrative regardless. So there isn't a painting I could paint underneath that theme, underneath that process that won't, wouldn't fit in the show. You know, catabasis is not something that I'm, I'm using like a pretty word. I, I really am going through a meditative internal process of going to the darkest places of my own psyche. And that doesn't mean like the places I think are spooky and cool. It means like literally the things that, that truly bother me, the things that upset me. I mean, everybody has phobias and fears and regardless if they say they do or they don't, you know, whether or not you're conscious of it or not is irrelevant. Everyone has issues. It's not about overcoming those issues. It's about going within them figuring out what they do for you, figuring out what they don't do for you, and incorporating them into you. And to me, the, the mythopoeic aspects of catabasis, you know, Orpheus traveling to Hades to get back Eurydice, is the perfect articulation. And I believe very, very, very strongly that that's what the myth is about, is about going into the internality. But I do think, speaking of Orpheus and Eurydice, that that myth is extremely misunderstood. It has everything to do with the heroine's journey and almost nothing to do with the hero's journey. Persephone and Hades knew that Orpheus was not going to be able to do what she asked him to do. And Eurydice was down in Hades on her own. She had chosen to do that. And the whole deal was, was the condition for Hades to allow Orpheus to bring Eurydice back out of Hades was that he could never turn around and look at Eurydice until the sun hit both their faces. And once they get to the top, his face is hitting the sun, and he hears this horrible sound behind him. He thinks, oh my God, something could be wrong with Eurydice. And the sun is on my face, so he turns around. And in almost all the translations, the only thing that Eurydice says at that point is farewell. Not, oh my God, you fucked up, you know, save me. It's farewell. He could not view her as an actual equal. She needed his help. She might need his help, so he turned around and looked. He could not view her that way. And, and to me, that is the essence of catabasis and going in, into an eternal place where the parts of yourself that you can't view as equal, the parts of yourself that you've shunned or had issues with, bringing them up and using them to create images and to further your understanding of your own self, I think is pretty potent. Internally, the way I kind of see the way things work is mythology talks about internal archetypes. So I think in a sense, like everybody has their own Eurydice, everybody has their own, you know, Odin, uh, Jesus Christ, you know, Satan, Lucifer, everybody has that internally within them. That's the way I see that. Mythology to me is an articulation over the internality. I think we know way more about the bottom of the ocean than we do our own psyche. And I think the explorers of psyche are artists, musicians, poets, fashion designers. Those are the explorers of the internal, of the areas that we don't understand. So, I mean, yeah, I have my own Eurydice and I'm gonna try to paint her and paint that and paint Hades the way I see them. I, I've never been more excited to do anything in my entire life. I always imagined that getting to do something like this, I would be full of anxiety and just terror that I would fail. And the strangest thing is, like this overwhelming calm and excitement 
has come over me. I, I can't wait to paint. It's just been joy, without hope, just absolute joy to be able to do this. I, I can't wait to sit in the gallery and look at, you know, what's happened. You know, I'm not saying it's going to be a success. It could be a massive failure. I don't know, but it will be one of the things I remember for the rest of my life, regardless of how it goes. Being able to sit back in a gallery that's filled with my work and they believed in me enough to do it. My art rep believed in me enough to do it. I believed enough in me to do it. It's been a dream of mine for, for my whole life. I mean, I was a strange kid and I would dream about having gallery shows. I would sit in my back porch in South Tola, Mississippi and I would think about being in a gallery and having the walls covered in the work I've done. I don't know how I'm gonna feel that night. You know, I mean, I, I really have no idea what it's gonna feel like. I think it's gonna feel good, but I'm expecting, in a sense, the unexpected. I don't, I don't know what it's gonna be like.